Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, that's for art, and we're going to read a little bit more from our book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution by Arthur Tamplin and John Goffman. And I think we're going to have an interesting beginning of a read. We're on Chapter 10, The Nuclear Weapons Program. Hmm, wonder what we're going to learn about this now. Probably nothing we haven't already lived. I mean, that's the way it's been so far. His worst fears have actually all come true. So, number 10, the nuclear weapons program. Uh, that's page 190. The development of nuclear explosive devices in use for warfare has been the major activity of the AEC. Let's read that again. The development of nuclear explosive devices in use for warfare has been the major activity of the AEC. It is worthwhile to retrace the course of this nation's policy with respect to nuclear weapons and to relate this to the development of nuclear we the nuclear weapons program coordinated between the AEC and the Department of Defense. Much the same as with the peaceful applications of nuclear energy, the proponents of nuclear weapons have proceeded in a Madison Avenue approach to push for the continued development and expansion of weapons systems. To a considerable extent, a demand for various nuclear weapons systems has been created in a manner quite similar to the demand for electricity which the power companies have created. Once these demands have been created, they are then stated to be needs. At the end of World War II, we had a monopoly on nuclear weapons, and in the intervening years we, pre we proceeded at a comparatively slow pace in the development of our nuclear warfare capa capa capability. Excuse me. However, it soon became apparent that the Russians could and actually were developing nuclear weapons of their own. Consequently, we moved into the crash program to develop the so-called hydrogen or thermonuclear bomb. It was, as, it was as part of this program that the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory in Livermore was created. History now tells us that both the United States and the USSR developed thermonuclear weapons, that both nations proceeded from the comparatively small 20 kiloton atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and into the development of multi-megaton nuclear bombs. Thus, it developed that the two major protagonists on the world scene both had a devastating capability in terms of nuclear weapons. The world, particularly the United States and the USSR, had arrived at an unthinkable situation. Each could destroy the other, but was, uncert was, was certain to be destroyed in return. This condition was unthinkable. Of, excuse me, this condition of unthinkability came about during the Eisenhower administration. In the late 50s, it became apparent that nuclear power politics had become part of the Cold War. The Eisenhower administration introduced that what one must consider to be the least irrational attitude towards nuclear weapons, namely that of massive retaliation. Huh, so let's repeat that sentence again. The Eisenhower administration introduced what one must consider to be the least irrational attitude towards nuclear weapons, namely that of massive retaliation. The policy which the United States adopted was that we would never use our nuclear weapons except in retaliation to a nuclear attack by another nation. At that particular time, that meant the Soviet Union. The massive retaliata retaliation philosophy did not mean that one nation would win and another nation would lose. The basic concept behind the mass retaliation philosophy was, let's face it, nobody has anything to gain by engaging in a nuclear war. Not only is there nothing to gain by engaging in nuclear war, there is practically everything to be lost. This was a realistic statement in the situa on the situation, and it still is. Great. 
New subtitle. No rational policy possible for use of nuclear weapons. The USSR philosophy towards nuclear weapons has never really been clear to the people of the United States, although it often has been implied that the Russians would use their weapons on the United States first. The Eisenhower philosophy was that we would never use our weapons first. We would only use them in retaliation, and our retaliation would be massive. This could be considered to be rather irrational, childish, but one must face the fact that this is the least irrational of all the policies concerned when, the use, when in the use of nuclear weapons. With the use of nuclear weapons, I apologize. There is no rational policy. It was probably because this policy was so childlike and the individual, the in, yeah, it was probably because this policy was so childlike that individuals began to question it. However, even today, it does not seem that the average man on the street has ever questioned the policy in a substantial way. The facts seem quite obvious to the average person and the limited degree of irrationality is accepted as the best approach towards the problem of nuclear weapons. But it is easy to see how this approach would not be well received by the military mind or the logistic thinker. Therefore, military types and scientists associated with the military, most notably Hermann Kahn, K-A-H-N, currently the director of, the, of Hudson Institute, began to conceive of devious strategies that might be employed in order to promote nuclear war. Promote nuclear war. Mr. Kahn and others therefore introduced into the dialogue the concept of first strike capability and civil defense and the devious concept of nuclear blackmail. In doing so, they began to lay the groundwork for, the pro pro for progressively more irrational approaches towards nuclear war and, the sti and stimulated the arms race to its present position. Now, he's talking in 1970. Imagine. As consequences of activities of individuals such as Herman Kahn, the unthinkability of nuclear war was pressed upon the American public, and the great civil defense debate began. Nuclear war crimes were being played, the dead were being counted, and nuclear strategies were being developed. An office of civil defense was established, and we were off towards a new era of formulating a nuclear weapon policy for this nation. A number of fallout shelter companies came into being. Governor Nelson Rockefeller spent some time sitting in a fallout shelter in public view. A great deal of effort was put into the civilian defense idea, but the public never bought it. The Office of Civil Defense was subsequently transferred to the Department of Defense. A number of fallout shelter signs have appeared throughout the country, mainly on buildings in the central cities. Some of these fallout shelters have a few supplies of water and food, but for the most part, our civil defense program has nothing more than a process of nailing up, has been nothing more than a process of nailing up signs. It has been quite a boon to sign painters and sign nailers. The situation had actually become so ludicrous that evacuation plans were developed for many metropolitan areas. These evacuation plans have subsequently been regulated to the trash can. The public was simply unwilling to accept the feasibility or the thinkability of a nuclear war. The Office of Civil Defense still does exist, but it does not represent any significant part of the national awareness. Since the very early 60s, Public discussions of the consequences, possibilities, and ramifications of the nuclear war have, have been completely absent. Wow. The civil defense debate, excuse me, the civil defense debate apparently convinced the public that nuclear war was too horrible to contemplate. I'm going to get a glass of water. Okay. Wow. The civil defense debate, debate had hardly ended when the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred. 
the American public was dramatically confronted with the real possibility of a nuclear war. One would have thought that this incident might have caused the public to change its mind with respect to civilian defense. But there was, there was not even a resurfacing of the debate, let alone a demand for fallout shelters. New subtitle. No public debate on nuclear weapons spendings. Nevertheless, during the 1960s, nuclear weapons programs prospered. In the absence of any public debate, this occurred with essentially a rubber stamp approval by the U.S. Congress. In a way, the budget requests of the AEC and the Department of Defense for nuclear weapon development had been approved by Congress with about as much public awareness as the annual request for the budget for tea tasters. Much like the public at large, the Congress probably preferred not to think about the unthinkable. It would have it would seem that after the rather scary public debate on civil defense, the public in Congress had, to, had decided to return to the concept of massive retaliation and that the budgets requested by the AEC and the Department of Defense were more or less approved on the assumption that this was the nuclear policy of the U.S. government. While there has been an absence of debate concerning civil defense and the effects of nuclear war since the early 1960s, studies of this nature have nonetheless been conducted since that time within the closed circuit confines of the DODAEC complex. It is somewhat difficult to believe that substantial sums of money have been spent over the last several years to count the dead, but a large variety of different nuclear attacks upon the United States have been, quote, war-gamed, unquote, to estimate the devastation and death that would result. So I'm going to stop there. That's at page 194. We're on a new subtitle. The next one's going to be, The Think Tanks Fight Nuclear Wars on Paper. And that's just exactly what they do, isn't it? So let me put my glasses on. Um, I probably won't post tomorrow night, you guys. I'm going to be super busy, and frankly, I try not to go more than three or four days, but I need a break, and so, I mean, I really need a rest, and I'm going to have to do my homework the next two days, so that's I probably won't do another video post on this for two more days. So, put your courage feet on, you guys, and um, I think I, unless you guys don't want to hear it, but I want to read Uncle Tom's Cabin next. I think I've decided on that. Whether you want to hear it or not, I think I'm going to read it. Ciao.